All right, Zoom, can you guys hear me? I'm going to double check my audio one last time. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. All right, <clears throat> we're going to start the lecture now. So uh, if you guys can stop what you're doing and pay attention. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. All right, so the first thing we're going to start off with today is markets. So in economics, there are four types of markets, perfectly competitive, monopolistically competitive, oligopoly, and monopoly. The last three market types are imperfectly competitive markets. And in these type of markets, firm have market power. Um, but in any market, firms want to produce at the quantity of which marginal cost equals marginal revenue. or And marginal revenue is basically the price at which the good is sold at. If a market has positive economic firms, firms will enter the market until economic profits are zero. And when economic profits go below zero, firms will leave the market until it's back up at zero. Okay. All right, so the first market we're gonna talk about is perfectly competitive, oh, whoops. Oh right, yeah, so the first market type we're going to talk about is perfectly competitive markets. So in a perfectly competitive market, the good in question is really standardized, and there's a lot of buyers and sellers, and each party knows information about the good, such as its price, its quality, etc. Uh, and in this market, buyers and sellers do not have any power to change the market price. The second type of market we're gonna talk about is the monopolistically competitive markets. So in this type of markets, there are basically low to no entries, uh, no barriers to entry. There are many differentiated products such as restaurants or book publishing. Um, and the thing that makes monopolistic competition special is that each product is differentiated. So they're not complete substitutes for one another. And now oligopoly. In an oligopoly, the market has a few suppliers. And unlike in a monopolistically competitive market, uh, each firm has to watch out for other firms' choices and actions. And so in an oligopoly, sellers can actually come together and to agree to s lower their supply so they can sell a higher price. This is known as a cartel, and it is illegal in the United States because of our antitrust acts. Um, a great example of a cartel in the world is the OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Um, and other examples of oligopolies are like airlines, oil, and tennis balls. And finally, we have a monopoly. In this type of market, there's only one supplier and Monopolies arise due to a few reasons. The three main ones are high barriers to entry, and one such barrier could be ownership to key resources, such as like diamonds. Um, government created like patents. And finally, natural, like water and electricity, where it's cheaper to have one firm supply than to have many. Uh, it would be cheaper to just have one company, for example, to uh, distribute water across a city rather than have like two or three water suppliers because it's simply not worth to spend that extra money building different water pipes to do the same thing. Um, and so because monopolies create social inefficiencies because they can sell at a higher price, uh, there are ways that we deal with monopolies in our economy. And the first of these are passing laws that regulate the impacts of monopolies, such as the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Uh, other ways of 
dealing with monopolies are regulation and public ownership. Equilibrium in competitive markets. So the equilibrium in a competitive market is basically the intersection between your demand and your supply curves. At this point, resources are most efficiently allocated here because you have your maximum total surplus. And in competitive markets, the price and the quantity will gravitate towards that equilibrium point. So moving away from equilibrium in a competitive market, if prices are higher than equilibrium, as you can see here in figure one, um, there is something that we call a surplus because there's more quantity supplied than quantity demanded. So when firms see that they have extra supplies that they can't sell, they are tempted to lower the price. And once they do, the quantity demanded will rise and prices will keep falling until you reach back to equilibrium. And so when prices are lower than equilibrium, we have something called a shortage, where your quantity demand is greater than your quantity supplied. And so firms in this case will be tempted to rise their prices because they see that they can sell more and not lose out. So that's what they'll do. And they only stop when the price reaches back to equilibrium. So now we talk about consumer and producer surplus. So as mentioned before, at the equilibrium, the consumer and producer surplus are maximized here. On a graph below the demand curve and above the price, the equilibrium price is your consumer surplus. The consumer surplus is basically the savings that a marginal consumer gains by buying at an equilibrium price because that consumer values the good at a higher price which means they could have bought it at a higher price, but because the market is selling at an equilibrium price, they're able to buy it at a lower price. And your producer surplus is this shaded area below the equilibrium price and above the supply curve. It's basically the profit that individual suppliers gain by selling at the equilibrium price, uh, because there are some sellers out there that can provide the good at a cheaper price, but because the market price level is higher than what they're what they can sell at they kind of make like a profit by selling at a higher price so now we talk about price controls and there are two types of price controls we're going to talk about here and the first one is price ceiling and the second is a price floor um, both price ceilings and price floors decrease market efficiency because you're basically setting a price away from equilibrium. A price ceiling is, uh, it basically sets a maximum price. So it's only effective if you put it below the equilibrium. And a price floor sets a minimum price for the market. And it will be only effective if you put it above the market equilibrium. All right, taxes. So taxes are basically what the government um, uses to get revenue. Taxes create dead weight loss because of the upward shift in supply or the downward shift in demand. Um, taxes will affect the curve that is less elastic. And even though you can't really tell from here, I just put two figures that show how taxes affect the market if it affects supply as you see on the left or demand on the right. So when you look at graphs talking about taxes, this triangle here is basically your debt weight loss. It is your loss in total surplus. And the red rectangle is basically the revenue generated by taxes. All right, now we talk about the production possibilities frontier or the PPF. The, the PPF basically shows the production of two goods that an economy can make. And on the PPF, you can see the trade-off between one good over the other. Um, some things to know about the PPF is that all points on this curve are efficient. If you're inside the curve, then you are producing at an inefficient point, basically meaning you don't have all your resources employed. 
And if you go outside of your PPF curve, you're at a point where you can attain this type of production because you simply don't have the resources to do it. Um, and so by changing the amount of the factors of production, basically land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, you can expand your PPF or shrink your PPF. And now we talk about comparative advantage and absolute advantage. So between two people or economies, one can have a comparative advantage if they can supply a good at a lower opportunity cost than the other party. And um, someone can have absolute advantage if they can simply produce more than the other person. And so here we have a hypothetical example of person A and person B and um, them making apples and bananas. So one thing when you look at like the questions when they ask you for comparative advantage, what I would like to do is always write, like find the opportunity cost and make it clear that it's like bananas per apple or apples per banana, like you see on the table. And so looking at this example, the person with the comparative advantage is if their opportunity cost is lower. So for person A, that would be bananas because they only sacrifice four out of 10 apples versus person B who has to sacrifice half an apple. And so person B has a comparative advantage in apples because they only sacrifice two versus two and a half. Uh, something to note here is if you know one person has the comparative advantage in one good, then the other person has a comparative advantage in the other good. You cannot have a person that has comparative advantage in both goods because it doesn't work like that. But it is possible for one person to have an absolute advantage in both items. And so if both person A and person B come together and trades, then it is highly recommended that person A produces uh, bananas and person B should produce apples. So why trade? So voluntary trade allows us to consume at a point outside our PPF. And it also allows us to consume at a lower opportunity cost than if we were to make it ourselves. In general, trade is beneficial, but it is harmful to specific parties. And that is why you always have someone out there uh, that's against the promotion of free trade. And to see how, uh, see how trade affects our market supply curves, here you see um, the quantity exported from, from trade. Because the world price is higher, it means domestic consumers, yes, they will suffer, but it allows our domestic suppliers to supply some of that to the world market where there's more demand. And on the same place when we talk about imports, the world price is lower than how much we can provide at. So domestic suppliers are not able to supply as much, but because there's a higher supply curve in the world market, we import some of that to make up for our demand. And now we talk about firms. So firms are basically economic actors that supply goods and services in the economy. Uh, they combine the factors of production to make these goods and services. And a firm's goal is to maximize on their profits. And profits are basically total revenue subtract the total costs. And talking about total costs, there's accounting and economic costs. Accounting costs is pretty straightforward. It's basically all the monetary costs that a firm has to spend on, such as electricity, labor, rent, etc. cetera. Um, and part of accounting costs is fixed costs or costs that are fixed in the short run, such as rent or equipment. And there are variable costs costs that will change in the short run, such as labor, electricity, or water. Um, economic costs is a little bit harder to calculate because it involves calculating the opportunity cost of 
the firms as well. And sometimes that in itself is a little bit challenging to calculate. And so at a certain point, a firm will face diminishing returns to scale. Basically, as they increase factors of production, their increase in productivity will start to decrease. And now we talk about creative destruction. So basically the concept of creative destructions is that entrepreneurs will seek to invent or innovate products to enter the market and avoid barriers of entry. And entrepreneurs do what they do because of the potential rewards of economic profits. And they gain these economic profits through patents because of their innovations or inventions. Um, entrepreneurship was turned by Joseph Schumpeter and to break down the creative destruction. The creative part is that entrepreneurs innovate and invent new products to add to the economy. And the destructive part is the inefficient allocation of goods because as we stated before, in the case of monopolies, because they have the patent, they can create a monopoly and through a monopoly, they can sell at a price that's higher than efficient. And so that's the end of day two. Do you guys have any questions, comments, or suggestions? No? Anyone on Zoom have any questions? Tyler? Oh, you can find day one's link on the Google Classroom. But if you want a general spiel, I talked about the concepts and assumptions of economics. Uh, supply and demand, and elasticity. Yeah. Uh, and the link for today's video will be up as soon as I am able to upload it. Okay. Zoom, do you guys have any questions? All right. So, Linz has a question. On the taxes, what is the loss of welfare? Is it okay if that's a little bit more explained? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll explain that really quick. All right, so the loss of welfare is basically the triangle you see on the graphs. And this is caused because of the tax. The reason why our points are labeled here, like the two dots, is because a tax is like the money. You It goes to the government. It doesn't go to the supplier or the demanders. So that's why supply shifts upwards and not to the left. Um, so this loss in welfare is caused because of that increase in prices where you have people that want to buy at a lower price and sellers that wanna sell at a lower price but are not able to because of the tax. And so that's why there's that welfare or that loss of welfare uh, Lin, does that explain it for you? Yeah, alrighty. Any other questions from the class or Zoom? No? Alrighty, then I guess we'll end our session here today. Thank you, Zoom, for attending, and thank you, class, for your attention. Um, you guys can do, I guess, whatever you guys want until the end of class. <laughs>